Hey, Chris. Yeah. I've killed all our co-hosts and you're next. I understand. Do you want to hear the loneliest tune in the world? Sure. This is the Mars Rover. Back in 2013, singing happy birthday to itself, all alone, on Mars. Could you imagine how sad that is? And it only did it once in 2013. <laughs> so it only had one birthday or just got now a birthday this, party one year? You know, yeah, just one year through a party. They they consider its birthday when it landed on Mars. I'd rather like not have a birthday party ever than have it once and never again. I agree. <laughs> Recently, I've talked a lot about home automation, and one of the systems I've been trying out is Google's Assistant. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't plan to use it much, but it's now it's baked into my Nvidia Shield TV mm -hmm. and my Android Wear, so I've got it, and it's obviously on my Nexus 6P, and it supports um, like my Hues lights and stuff like that, so it's kind of useful, mm -hmm. but it's not as fully useful as I'd say like the Echo is. Uh, and uh, I've got one of these watches that successfully has been updated to the latest version of Android Wear 2.0, which. Thankfully, uh, when I bought it, I bought it with the hope that they would update it to Android Wear 2.0. And it just recently sent out an update to Wear 2.0 users that has broken Google Assistant on the watch. Hmm. And so now you can't invoke the Assistant um, except for doing searches. It, it will do searches, but it will not do scheduling. It will not do timers. It will not do any home automation. And speaking of timers, kind of related to that, for a while now reoccurring reminders have been broken on Wear, and this latest update did not fix them. And so you can't have reoccurring reminders that work reliably on your watch with Android Wear. It's so frustrating that I've essentially just stopped using my Wear device altogether. Um, and I don't really have a lot to say on the topic. It's just, from a meta sense, what really gets me about it, and why I actually get genuinely angry about it, is these are lessons we have learned. And I know I make this point probably too much, but what the hell? Like, these these updates don't need to break like this. Like, there's there's five devices they have to test against. It's not like the phones. Like, how did they not learn from Android on the phone and from Windows on the desktop before that? How did they not learn how to do this right? Maybe they just don't care that they're breaking updates for the 10,000 people that bought the, the watches. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. That's got to be what it is. <laughs> You see that uh, the Ars Technica article where uh, the boot what? Um, apparently, they did a study, and the Fitbit actually makes people exercise less. Really? Yeah. How? Uh, because people are are super into it for the first couple of weeks, but then they start feeling like pressured that they're not doing well enough, so they mm -hmm. just give up. Maybe. Yeah, I could totally see that. I'll tell you, though, from my personal experience with both Angela and Tadia. Uh, yeah, but they're they're also very highly motivated people. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah. Like, Angela will walk circles around the kitchen to meet her goal if she's, like, say, 100 steps short. And Hadia, Hadia will dance and walk in the RV while we're going down the rig on a travel day if we've been driving all day and she wants to meet her steps. She'll pace the RV while they're, we're driving down the rig. They also seem like by default to be like physically inclined people to me. Yeah, they are both physically active, but uh, yeah, there's that. Uh, so I am the opposite myself. I track, but I mostly track it to shame myself into, into doing something because I look at it and go, holy crap, dude, this has been a bad week for you. Get your ass outside. Go, go, go film <laughs> something, go do something. I do use it for that a bit. Um, I, I don't like to be down on anything like that though, because it all comes down to the individual. And how you apply it. So it, I I currently am tracking a, my weight via Bluetooth scale, and I weigh myself every day. I track my sleep and my respiration and my heart rate uh, constantly during the night, and I track my heart rate and my steps during the day. I track my stand when I uh, how often I stand versus sit. That's automatically tracked. Um, I if I do deep breathing, I track that um, using my health app. Uh, so, and I also track my fasting when I, tra when I'm fasting, I track that and I don't track it. I track it as a way to motivate myself to continue because I'm, I am the type of person where I need to see results to continue to push myself. And when I have data that says you sleep better when you do this, 
Your heart rate is lower for days when you do this. You are losing weight when you do this. And when I can, because I am so focused on work and what I'm, what I'm creating and what's going on that I don't pay enough attention to myself and my own health. I don't pay attention to my body and what it's doing properly. And I fail to notice trends. I fail to notice patterns that people observing me probably observe and notice about myself way before I do. I'm a dumb, slow man, and it takes me a very long time to realize that when I eat X, I feel like Y. And I should stop eating X because it makes me feel like Y, and Y is really bad. It takes me way too long to figure that shit out. It takes me way too long to figure how I, how I behave, what I do, how I exercise, what my activity is, how it impacts my sleep. That correlation, I should have figured it out... 20 years ago. So having data that says, hey, dumbass, when you stop walking, look at this curve curvature in your sleep that just keeps trending worse. And look, now you're you're a week and a half into, into slacking and look at this trend line. Like, I, I can't deny it because it's my own data that I have, I have tracked, I've verified, and the data shows when I do, when I do these things, I sleep better, I, I feel better, my heart rate's lower. So I, I, I definitely see how you could get super anal and get way up in your head about looking at these numbers. Like, you know, well, I, th- I think sometimes Angela does go a little nutty with the walking, like walking circles around the kitchen. That's a little nutty. See, but for me, I'm like 30 days, maybe maybe three months max. And then I'm going to just then I'm just going to like figure out what works for me. And then I don't need to track it so much. But for like for like 30 days to three months, super valuable for me. Well, I think on top of that, it's also different there because you've gone out of your way to highly individualize it for yourself. And that's actually one of the things they brought up in here. They said uh, part of the problem is that Fitbit's targets are unrealistic and not tailored to tailored to individuals. Mm. Like the 10,000 steps a day goal, for example. Just like a blanket by, thing that they do. Yeah, it was described by participants as unfair. Wow, unfair. Well, yep. you can adjust it, but the right default reigns supreme. I said they so they strive to achieve it, but would often fall short, and that made them feel really bad about themselves and put them off of exercise. Jeez, that's a cycle that could just well. Feed they itself. specifically were also target or uh, researching uh, teenagers, which I feel like they're probably more susceptible to stuff like that as well. It it really just is begging for gamification. Yeah, if you could set goals, achievements, milestones, rewards around all of this stuff, you could really get a lot of kids out there exercising. Well, if you could use some of the stuff that 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 tracks your entire life already to uh, tailor these things to individual people to make it fit their style better, it probably would catch on more. Take Okay, so I know everybody likes to make fun of Pokemon Go now, but let's just look at Pokemon Go. If you took something that was AR... Mm-hmm. And it was connected to your health data. So your phone, Google or, Fit, and here, Apple Health have all that data. How about this? Getting away from the, the whole Pokemon Go stigma, what about something like Zombie Run? Yeah, only with AR. I mean, yeah. saying like I, I, the reason why I bring up AR is... Yeah, put your phone behind you, look at the zombies chasing you. Right, you could gamify exercise with it, and you could bring in silly elements like guns and bombs and, and zombies into the real world... And it's specifically talking about kids. I feel and, like, and honestly, myself, I, that that would be awesome. I feel like that might cause an uptick in like terrorist calls. <laughs> yeah, maybe. But yeah, but if I'm a developer and I'm creating something using AR Kit or I'm creating something using uh, Google's uh, uh, system, the fact that you could tie in with their step data. Mm-hmm. and um, all other health sensor data, and then you could augment the character in the games abilities based on how how fast you're moving because it's got gps too right so you could track how much ground you're moving and you could actually have a player have more health you could all these things that you could you could apply in game based on a user's real-time health and location data i feel like that's really untapped and pokemon go is like a little preview of what's to come i feel like the people that have the most data that would be useful for this kind of stuff are the people that aren't touching this market like you've got Apple with the Apple Watch and you have Google with uh, the Google stuff. But don't forget these phones all have pedometers built in too. So even if you don't have a wearable, you're still getting steps. You still have GPS location. Well, yeah, but I'm saying even, I mean, they, that's the thing. They are making wearables, but they're not applying their wearables to health like Fitbit is trying to do. And I don't really understand why. I disagree. I mean, well, I, no, I agree I'm, with Google. They, they are applying it in the way that they're tracking the health, but they're not 
try, uh, applying it in the way that they are trying to get you to be healthier. So uh, the the way I see the reason I disagree. So he, here's the thing. The Apple Watch out of the box, and I've turned all this off, but out of the box, there is a pretty extensive achievements and goals and badges system for your activity huh. that they do. Um, and then a step beyond that, they are they are getting FDA permission to test real-time glucose monitoring and um, oxygen levels in your blood. And they also, there was a, there was a pretty extensive comparison of heart rate monitoring from like devices that are built to monitor your heart rate and Fitbit and the Apple watch. And the Apple watch was consistently the most reliable performing to the point where it could be used as a like FDA approved tool. Uh, So I, and they have, Apple also has two labs where people are using this to do exercise stuff. At at the same time, I feel like Amazon is the one, or not Amazon, Apple is the one that's uh, least equipped to do this kind of stuff. Because I feel like the value of tracking that data is that you can then do use other stuff your with giant it? no no you can use your giant super cluster yeah. to I agree to figure out yeah like patterns and methods right and Apple doesn't really do that no well I mean the all of the health data is locked on each individual phone exactly where Google fits is is a, is a system that syncs it to the cloud and then Google can run massive analytics across that so I'm actually I'm generally a fan of Google and I actually like a lot of their data tracking because I feel like an, <laughs> like it, you're so great I no, love it listen, I feel like it can inform stuff dude yeah I agree I just feel like what you get is really not worth well the that's what of- I was gonna say I was going to say I feel like this is one of those places where Google is just stumbling yeah. with what they could be doing here yeah I mean, could you imagine? Like, they could have a killer product, and they're just not doing it. Could you imagine if they could start to suss out trends and health warnings and stuff like that? I mean, there's so many legal minefields well, yeah, there. yeah, that I don't think they'll ever do because of those legal minefields. Yeah, maybe. So the um, the health kit approach is a local database, and then the app vendors can create an app that talks to that via an API. And then when you install the app, you you grant that app what it has access to of your health information. Then what, depending on what you allow it, they could run, you know, like 23andMe or whatever it is, could release an app that reads all your health data and combines it with your DNA analysis. So you don't you don't have to have a huge cloud infrastructure. You just have to have somebody coming around, coming around making a killer product that uses the although, data. Although uh, Amazon does have that cloud infrastructure as right. well. And they were getting to that health yeah. market. Yeah. Why haven't they announced a fitness band? Well, you know, it doesn't even take a fitness band, right? Wouldn't it just take maybe an well, API that Fitbit would want to integrate because doctors are using it? Like, imagine if if Jeff Bezos goes in and says, uh, "We're going to take yeah, this." Yeah, but Amazon wants every product, Chris. So you think you think they'd make their own fitness tracker? Why not? And make it. Yeah, they made their own phones. I mean, it didn't do well, but they made their own phones. Right, and even if it was like an Amazon basis. And with when it comes to fitness trackers, there's not nearly as much competition as there is with phones. Dude, if that becomes a product. That is going to be a mind-blowing prediction if you are right on that, right? <laughs> like, that's going to be one of those we'll look back and go, that was the thing Rikai called. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sending an invite out to the entire user air audience, to all of the airs out there. I'm already out. Total solar eclipse of the heart hangout. <laughs> Monday, August 21st, on the Pacific Wayside Crest in Oregon, Right where the total solar of the eclipse 2017 is just like, it's actually, I think, going dead over Lincoln City, and we're going to be just north of Lincoln City. But I feel like the sun and the moon are so far away that the 20 mile distance really doesn't matter. What Chris is saying here is that he wants to be real close to you in the dark. Well, so nobody has signed up for the hangout or the meetup, meetup.com slash Jupiter Broadcasting. No one has signed up. But apparently a listener of the show's wife is going to go. (laughs) <laughs> so there's that's happening, but Hadi- why didn't they sign her up? I don't know, I don't know. But uh, Hadi and I are going down there. Uh, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Maybe I'll vlog it. I don't know. I just felt like if I a solar like eclipse of the heart's happening twenty mile, two hundred miles south of Seattle, yeah, it's I, pretty much a, a once in a lifetime event. I should go, right? Like yeah. I have, I I should go. Yeah, I don't have any shows Monday, so I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go down there, and I'm gonna I'm just gonna try to film the whole thing. Never invited the beard. You want to come? No, yeah, I didn't think so. <laughs> Plus, who's gonna flip the switch for Ask Noah if you go? Yeah, who's going to flip the switch for Ask Noah? Yeah. Who's going to edit Ask Noah? Right. Who's going to keep this network on the air? I know. This Chris guy doesn't do it anymore. So if you want to hang out with me while the beard does all the work, meetup.com slash Jupiter Broadcasting Solar Eclipse Hangout. I think it's going to be fun. Could also be insanity. Over a million people are expected to come into the area. Oh, boy. 
you know what I've recently realized about myself, and it is not an attractive aspect of me? Mm -hmm. It's new gear plays a role in my excitement about creating content. So when I have a new lens... I think that's pretty common, though. I know, but it's it's a really unfortunate position when you don't have any money. Because <laughs> I sit around like, you know, it's a huge element of driving content for me. Because if I have a new lens, there's content in talking about that, maybe in the vlog or on this show. But also, uh, it creatively drives me to figure out how to incorporate that new tool into my shooting regime. It means that I go out and I have motivation to like snap this thing on my camera and get outside. And gets me walking around and shooting stuff. Which then means I end up with content for the vlog. Which then means I'm publishing the vlog. And it's like this entire cycle. And... When I go into these periods where I can't spend money for months and months and months because I took my kids on one summer road trip, so now I'm like financially strapped for three months, so I don't, I can't do anything. Yeah, I, I feel like my content creation suffers. I mean, I feel like I'm honestly the wrong person to talk to because I'm very similar. Because honestly, I I, I could create Twitch content with the gear I have. It just wouldn't be as good of content that I want to create. Right. So and, I just went and spent a bunch of money. <laughs> well, and yeah, and it's also like I hate stagnation. Like, so part of my problem is, is I've I've figured out my all my current camera gear. Yeah. I figured it all out. Like I've learned how to use it. I know what it excels at. I know where it's weak. I know if I was going to replace it, what I'd replace it with that would do a better job at those weak areas. Mm -hmm. And so the need to like pick up this piece of equipment and learn how it works has subsided. And I'm left with, well, these are now just the tools that I use to do a task, and they don't necessarily excite me or not excite me. They're just, it's like a wrench. And so uh, how do you, okay, so I before feel... you say what you got, because I want everybody to know, but like, how do you know though? Like, how do you know when it's not just, I want new toys to play versus this is going to push me forward, this is going to challenge you, challenge me either creatively or technically or whatever. Like, where do you, when do you know it's you having fun with toys versus you pushing yourself? See, I don't think in this case it necessarily is you ever wanting to have fun with toys, but just a subconscious desire to put out the, the best product that you can. And there's there's always ways that you're going to be able to improve. Even if it's incremental improvements, it's still improvements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I could see that because I do know that one of the things is once I learn sort of the limits of my gear, I start to do like this research process where I go out and I, I read reviews and I watch footage shot on different cameras or different equipment. Yeah. How and can I, I address this? This right. Even if it's a small issue, how can I address right. this issue and make it even smoother? But then the problem is, it's like, okay, well, now I know how to fix the problem. I know what my current limitation is. And now I'm, now I'm aware of I'm not doing it as well as I could be doing yeah. it. Yeah. And so that's you, a so, really crappy place so to you, be in. So you want to spend a ton of money to fix it? Why can't I tell them? Why can't I say to myself, all right. Smart guy. Because good enough is never good enough. Figure out how to make it great with the existing equipment. Why can't that be a challenge to myself? Why can't I challenge myself to make something amazing with simple stuff? Just my, like, what, what's, what's wrong with me? Like, some of the greatest stuff that's getting published today isn't necessarily shot on red cameras. Because it feels like if you are wait, if you're spending time trying to figure out how to work around your equipment, that's less time you're spending on making the content itself better. Mm, yeah, there's something about when the gear you're using is the friction point. It sort of just totally takes all of it. The, it drags you down. Yeah, yeah. It's like yeah. it's like putting anchors on your project. Yeah, that's wise, Beard. So what? So you just recently uh, made a big purchase? Yeah, I uh, I bought a GTX 1080 Ti. Oh, oh, the Ti. Oh, that's right. We've been talking. Uh, yeah. This is something we've talked about since early user. Era. The water cooled version. Oh, really? Yeah. Now, when With you the say one. When you say water cooled, does that mean you supply the, the like the, the back end plumbing and cooling? Or no, is that... it's it's an all in one unit. Is it yeah. huge? Is it is it ginormous? No, it's it's uh, okay. It's about the the size square wise of a one hundred and twenty millimeter fan and yeah. about twice as thick. When's the last time you bought like a huge video card for yourself? Um, shortly after I moved here. So or shortly almost before? four, yeah, like yeah, four years ago. Yeah, I got a GTX 970 right after they came out. A 970? Mm hmm So this must feel really good then. Yeah. Why a TI? Um, best performance I could get. Yeah, and if you're going to make the plunge and then hang with it for it, like another five years. It mostly came down to I was forward looking to eventually doing 4K 60 FPS stuff. And that's pretty much the only card in the market that can do it. Hmm. Wow. Have you uh, actually put it in yet? 
Uh, I put it in. I have not turned on the system since oh, I don't have man. a monitor for it. It just showed up, too. It just showed up. So that's... I wow. actually had some trouble installing it. Because it's so huge? Uh, well, kind of, <laughs> but more so because I have a 320 millimeter radiator mm. and um, it Why was the... bumping up against it. Why the hell? Because the radiator is mounted in the top. And then the uh, the CPU goes yeah. or the cooler goes on the back where the rear fan would normally go. Yeah, and it was just thick enough that I couldn't make it. But if I remove the top two screws that are holding the fan on, yeah, I can slide it in there. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So I need to find some very flat headed screws to replace those ones. I don't know. I mean, just a little duct tape, you'll be all right. You'll be fine. Well, the way it is now, the radiator is holding it. Sure, <laughs> sure. What that sounds so good. So I guess as long as it doesn't vibrate, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I legitimately in the RV, I'll stack things to just like hold them in place. Sometimes <laughs> it's kind of like that, you know, because it's like you're not gonna move it a lot. So, yeah. <laughs> gosh, I don't know if I could wait. I think I feel like I would have to hook up my old monitor and just fire it up. Well, the problem is if I hook up that system, your old systems with all of your stuff is well not, not accessible. Not only that, but that other system is supposed to be running OBS. So in the setup, it's a two PC setup. So I kind of need to be able to access both PCs. Yeah, I was gonna say VNC, but when you said OBS, I was like, oh, you're not gonna want to do that through VNC. Yeah, no. Jeez, dude. Does uh, does Windows have? Doesn't Windows have like G G GPU accelerated RDP sessions or something by now? I mean, it's 2017. What the heck? Well, probably. But the the other thing about it is that in addition to uh, being OBS, I want a second monitor so I can play the games, but also view the chat at the same time. Well, let's be honest. You probably want like three or four or five monitors. So going down a monitor is not the direction you want to go. Yeah. <laughs> you're, at minimum, I need two monitors. We're, just, we're doing this show offline, mind you. We're not even streaming, and there are one, two, three, four, five monitors in front of us If right we now. don't count our phones. And you don't count the laptop that's behind that monitor, which also has a screen. <laughs> It just got a ridiculous, so I totally understand. In fact, now that we're sort of getting more involved with Discord, I've been like thinking more and more. Like, I almost, I almost need a dedicated monitor for Slack, Discord, and Telegram. Yeah, and IRC. Yeah. I, I, which sounds ridiculous, but I, they're up. They're like, it's like a heads-up dashboard. It's up all the time. I don't know. I feel like for you, I specifically would recommend not to do that, though. Yeah, mostly just because how distracted you get by people talking to you. Well, here's here's what I was actually thinking: is put like, them all on that monitor and turn it off when you don't uh, want to see them. <laughs> just off, just power it off. No, I was thinking like I'll, I, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to observe when is, so what work is best at what time, and mm-hmm. what I'm learning is. If I want to really read something, like I want to read, like, uh, say, uh, a document that's been leaked or uh, a new law or a, a Linux Weekly news thread that's, like, super long or an entirely new topic about, say, Stratus, the, 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 the new Red Hat uh, project for uh, orchestrating, basically, a, a ZFS mm-hmm. alternative. And I wanted to just learn all of that stuff. Uh, what I have found is my mornings are the best the best mornings for me are the mornings when I don't even need any caffeine, like until like 10 o'clock, but like around like 7 or 8 a.m. I'm actually awake. I'm feeling great. I can sit down and read the shit out of stuff. Like, I don't know what's up in the mornings, <laughs> but my my attention span is like, boom, laser focused. And so I don't open up Telegram. I don't open up Slack. I don't open up IRC or Discord until I've t- milked that. I feel like you just explained why your attention's laser focused. Yeah, well... Uh, those were things that I, I started doing after I realized I was in a zone. Like I, I, I so those I started doing after well, the fact. I guess I guess what I'm saying is those things are the things that end up taking you out of the zone. Yeah, oh for sure. So for you, sure. So I guess your default state is you start in that zone and then you get on that yes. stuff and it pulls you out. Right. So what I figure is I milk I feel like in those first couple of hours in the morning, sometimes I'm here in the studio, sometimes before I even get in the car, sometimes what I do is I really, I really strike the perfect trifecta is I start something rolling at home. Mm -hmm. Something I'm working on, something in my head. I jump in the truck, listen to music on the whole drive down, and I just chew on it and chew on it and chew on it. No distractions. I put everything in D&D mode and I just drive. And what's great about my drive is it's pretty far up north in Washington. So I just cruise control it. It's like, you know, it just requires basic instincts to drive. I get here and then I can execute on it. And then after I get it out, this, you know, we're talking like it's 10 a.m. at this point, Mm -hmm. 1030 usually. And I feel like I've 
I've I've gotten a huge amount of work yeah, done. Sunk three, four, five hours into it. Yeah, and so then it's like then I can then I transition. I start doing emails, and then sort of like maybe like we do a show usually around that time, mm-hmm. and then after that, after the show's over, I'm kind of in the perfect mindset to interact with the community, and I mm-hmm. then I fire up Twitter and Discord and IRC, and I start responding to people on Telegram, and like I start just doing all of the social stuff because so if people want your attention, do it in the afternoon, probably after, after yeah. all your work's done. Yeah, because. Usually by two, three o'clock, my my focus is starting to drift quite yeah. a bit. My energy's trailing a bit, and so yeah, I know. Lighter... Sometimes you you give me show notes that aren't done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but in the mornings I'm always on point, point. Uh, and so it's like I I sort of I shift towards like stuff that's less analytical, less critical thinking, and more socialization in the afternoon, where I feel like I'm sort of more naturally inclined to do that kind of behavior too. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so that's been working. That's been working well for me. And I feel like when I'm in that mode, it'd be a great time to have like a like the dashboard up. Boom. Okay, Chris is in talking to the public mode and all this stuff's up on his screen. Maybe we should call it the uh, the Chris Fisher dashboard. <laughs> I just need like a master oh, toggle oh, switch. How about this? The Ass Chris dashboard. Oh, no, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm letting no own that. I did, but I, I do need like either like an echo automation or like a big red button that I press and it, yeah. it like sets everything, switches from DND to public uh, or online or available. Or, uh, or a monitor flips down from the ceiling <laughs> with all the stuff on it. <laughs> Social stuff. Status online. All the lights in the room start <laughs> flashing red. <laughs> you know, we could actually... Red alert mode. What's funny is all of this is achievable yeah. <laughs> these days. <laughs> uh, well, I will take this moment to make a PSA. If Chris has just done a show, don't message him for like an extra hour after that because yeah. he's still working. Help the beard out. Help <laughs> the beard out because that's uh, that's how he gets good show notes with good tags and good links and good That goes notes. for everybody. If you know yeah. Chris, if you don't know Chris, don't talk to him after yeah. his show. <laughs> that is, you know what, most people assume that once I... And the show. Yeah, once it's back on reruns, that I'm done working. Yeah, but it, no. it's a whole other mode. So people, people, what they what they really seem to try to respect, although they don't always succeed at it, is the live time. But there is, there is way, way more work before a show than there is during a show. So yeah. if a show is an hour and a half long, it's it's minimum six hours of prep. Minimum. I'm thinking of like Linux Unplugged, which might be eight. I feel hours. like the actual. Recording of the show is the easiest part of the show. 100, 100 it, it, percent. It's like an upside down bell curve. Yeah, it is. It is the most fun. It is the least amount of work because what you've done is you've done all of the work ahead of time. You've done all the research, all the links. You've done the guest coordination, all of it. It's all lined up so that way you can just sit down and chillax, which if you think about it, it's the perfect way to do it, really. So that way the show, the actual production of the show itself is the least stressful part. So that way we're chill when we're doing a show. It makes a ton of sense. But then afterwards, you got to actually do all this business stuff. Like you got to put notes together and tags for the Internet and links for, and all this stuff. And then rekai has got to edit it together and put it all up on the website yeah. and put it out in the feeds. <laughs> My job starts as soon as everybody else's finishes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and then as soon as that's done, it starts all over again. <laughs> <laughs> or in the case of this show, it never stops. <laughs> yeah, that's true. This this show is the easiest to record and it's the, the e- hardest to edit. I feel like it's the easiest to plan and the easiest to record and the hardest to edit. Yeah. It's yeah. like you have to have a certain amount of difficulty in recording any show and you just have to choose where to allocate it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that is very true. linuxacademy.com slash unplugged. Man, if I had this back in the day, this is a platform to learn about Linux, all the stuff built on top of Linux, and of course, the low-level stuff. And they've got all kinds of systems to make it work well for you, including schedule planners that give you nice, gentle reminders to meet your goals, labs that spin up on demand when you need them. You pick a distribution, the labs and the courseware match that. They have paths for learning. If you just want to learn a specific career track or content, it's just, I mean, all of the boxes are checked with Linux Academy. Chris, I got to say something here. Uh, I don't know if this will get you in trouble with Linux Academy or not. Go from the heart, Beard. I hate Linux Academy. <gasps> you know why? Oh, my goodness. Because it makes everybody else as smart as I am about this stuff. <laughs> there is this problem, right, where uh, back in the day, even pre, I sound like such an old man, I, I kind of imagine to some people when I say this, but. You when, had special knowledge that made you super valuable. I did, because when I worked, when I first started working in IT, there was not a Google. Yeah. 
There wasn't a Google even. And so like this stuff, what made me extra valuable. And now what it does, and this really pisses me off if I'm being honest with you, is it enables all these damn developers who yeah. don't need us sysadmins anymore <laughs> because they can just go to Linux Academy, become total experts on Linux using this platform, and then they can do the development and the sysadmin all on their own, and they don't need Chris. <laughs> <laughs> LinuxAcademy.com slash up flat. Does free yourself from the need of a Chris and learn more about Linux. Linuxacademy.com slash unplugged and sign up for a free seven-day trial. Man, they figured out how to get rid of you. They should tell me. <laughs> <laughs> There's no winning on YouTube. There's no winning. I have a vlog episode that uh, somehow made it into the general interest of the RV community. Mm -hmm. It's got about 23,000 views as we record this episode. And uh, it's it's collected a few comments. What I'm learning, Chris, is that your uh, your fellow RVers, they're a whole bunch of assholes. Well, it's an older, grumpier folk is what it is. And so there's this episode of my vlog. Oh, it's it's the RV version of the Unix Greybeards. It is. It's a, that is is what it is. Exactly. <laughs> it's 100 percent what it is. I've got this episode called "We Had to Abandon Our RV," and it's dead smack of this cold snap we had this winter where everything froze and it went. It stayed below 20 degrees for a week. And that doesn't normally happen here. And work was really crazy busy, and I didn't properly prepare my RV for this. And so the water leading up to our RV froze, which wasn't our fault, but the water in our RV froze for a bit too. And I made a vlog about it because I was, I was vlogging pretty regularly back then and uh, posted it. Months go by. Months go by. It's got, you know, it's got a few thousand views, exactly what I expected. The, the YouTube algorithm has figured out a certain percentage of the Jupiter Broadcasting community on YouTube that like stuff just outside of Linux too. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's showing them my videos. And it's essentially... The user it's, error crowd. <laughs> yeah. It's essentially like it's whittled out like a great group of people who are intensely and insanely awesome and positive in my comments. Always really like the best, the best feedback I get on the network is the work wait, wait. I do with the vlog. You're telling me that something Google did it's causing positive yeah, comments? until it hit the general RV community. And that is really, that's when I noticed a tone change. Um, the uh, Here's an example of a comment that came in from uh, Hamish Ferguson. Uh, the comment reads, faggot. That is the entire comment, just just faggot. It's, it's nice because in this particular video, you, you had a time before it hit the public, and then you had yeah. time afterwards. Yeah. You have comparison. I really do. Yeah, you can see it. Just you can go. It doesn't read the happen often. Rates. Usually, it, it, like something spikes immediately. And by the way, a video in which my girlfriend and I live in an RV together. <laughs> and, it, and there's also a, a common another one. So faggot was a good one. Also, uh, I got typical liberal. I thought that was well, good. Chris, I, I also got gayest video ever. I hear, so the 90s are apparently in, in, in back. <laughs> I, I hear if you spend a lot of time around women, you become one of those homosexuals. <laughs> the guy that said this is the gayest video ever, I just said, thank you. Because like, what, what, like, what are you guys going to say <laughs> right? to that, right? Like, what a stupid thing to say. People are hostile, hostile. And what, what they're really hostile about is uh, I boo-booed. I really boo-booed. I just, I got busy. And life got busy, and my water froze. And uh, this guy, this guy, uh, this guy really. Some of these people really, really tore me up because it's RV basics to prepare your RV for winter. And I didn't want to make that mistake again this year. And so uh, I got heavier and heavier into automation, things that could temp temperature sense and, and trigger uh, a heater or something that detects water and sends me an alert to sort of avoid this problem. And as I got heavier and heavier into home automation. I ran into more and more issues with my Wi-Fi network in Lady Jupiter. That's the RV. It just crashed three times a day. Sometimes it would the Wi-Fi AP would stay up, but the DHCP service crashes, uh, which is disastrous when that happens in 2017. It's back in the past, you know, a machine would have held on to its IP lease for like the three days or six days, whatever you got it. You know, at home I actually just set it for like seven days because what do I care? I got I got hundreds, so I got hundreds to give out. What do I care if a machine holds on to an IP for seven days? So at home, you know, DHCP server seven day lease have added hosts. So if the DHCP server goes down for a couple of hours, nobody should care, right? No. Not in the world of Android connected devices. <laughs> no, no. If the DHCP server isn't available or it can't ping out to 8.8.8 .8 after a while, you know what it does? It abandons that Wi Fi network. It puts it on the forget list, it disassociates with it, and it doesn't even try to join that Wi Fi network anymore. Imagine what a nightmare is. Imagine this for a moment. If your Wi Fi network crashes three times a day, 
It's the only way you can provide infrastructure, networking infrastructure to your home because it's an RV and there's metal walls and there's you can't really drill through the floors. Like You are limited to Wi-Fi. I can't mm-hmm. just run Cat6 or fiber everywhere, which is what I did in the studio and what I did in Angela's house. I just ran Ethernet everywhere. And I just, I just, wireless was something I put my phones on. But now, wireless runs my security cameras. It runs my temperature sensors, my water sensors, my lights, my heater. It's, it's my internet access for a job that I use, for a job that I do on the internet. Like, it's fundamental to how I make my living. It's fundamental to how I manage my RV. It's, it is, it is like a utility at this point. It's as important as water and power. I think that you forgot to mention the worst part, though, uh, Wasn't there at least one device where if it didn't connect to Wi-Fi for long enough, it started just boot looping? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's which was which was that's next level screw up. Yeah. Which was a which was a smart plug too, which was really awesome because it would power cycle the device every time it rebooted. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So I had to address my Wi-Fi, and I wasn't sure what I was going to go with because I need to I need to deploy something in my RV, and I need something that can penetrate metal. Mm And I need to deploy something in Angela's house too. And I don't want to manage two different systems. And she has, she has a, she has a, a multi-level home, so she needs something that will do multi-router mesh or repeating or boosting or something. And you need something that supports both five gigahertz and two point four. Right, five yeah. for the fast stuff, yep. two point four for the penetration. Absolutely, absolutely. And so I was looking at a couple of different options out there. There's Google Wi-Fi is probably the most common one, and it's also the most uh, economically priced. Mm-hmm. There are uh, Unity access points, but then I would have to also manage that uh, and get like a little management. There's also Amplify HD, which uh, is also another mesh solution. I think the the high end one that most people go for is the Unify. Yeah. Yeah, and then there's Eero, which is one of the newer contenders. They just recently had a new... Arrow. Uh, Arrow. Arrow. <laughs> E-E-R-O. And they just recently had a new product release. Um, and I, I was really on the fence. I was also considering doing some some custom like ROM thing. And uh, I saw an article posted on May 1st by Jim over at PCPer.com. And mm-hmm. I, I like PC Per quite a bit. And they did a, they did a comparison of essentially all these solutions. And they did a performance tests. They did mesh networking uh, tests. They they did all kinds of benchmarks as you'd expect from PC Per. And the the Aero Aero solution standed out pretty strongly. In fact, it was uh, it was the best performing in some scenarios. It was the most reliable in some scenarios. It had the best range. Mm-hmm. It had the most intelligent on the demand on demand mesh networking in QoS. So it sort of turned my head a little bit. When I saw a PC Perspective actually talking pretty positively about it. This, this, this thing I've never heard of is really great. Yeah, yeah. And so I, I did more reading. I, they have a subreddit, which I'll link to in the show notes. And one of the things that really turned me on about, about that was the developers of the Eero software and hardware are active in the subreddit answering like straight up just you got a tech question, they're answering them, which is mind-blowing to me right now because I have very specific questions about um, – there is a there is a Bluetooth low energy uh, networking protocol mm-hmm. that uh, uh, that I a couple of my devices use, and uh, I wanted to know if they supported it. And then it turns out that like they have incredible support for it. Like they'll repeat it. It's just it's it's so great, and you'd be able to get that direct answer. So not only do they fix Wi Fi, they probably fix Bluetooth too. So I yeah uh, they so I I ordered an Eero system for the RV, and I mentioned that recently on the show. And mm-hmm. so since last episode, I've installed it. And I've been testing it for a week solid. And so I thought I would just give you a quick overview. This is a, uh, there's a, there is a main Aero wireless AP, and then I have one beacon. And these beacons, they plug into an outlet, and it's about the size of a large nightlight. In fact, they've actually integrated a nightlight into it if you want it. <laughs> and when you plug it in, it, it syncs up with the main AP, and it becomes a, a one contiguous Wi-Fi network. And uh, it becomes a node. Yeah. And it just extends the Wi Fi in that area. And it is just with the base alone AP, the strongest Wi Fi I have ever seen. I, 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 I can't describe to you how amazingly strong this Wi-Fi is. I would say, uh, just roughly measuring it, I went out about 2,000 feet from my RV. To, I walked 2,000, about 20, actually about 2,500 feet away from my RV, and I still had great signal. 
<laughs> I mean, it is very strong Wi-Fi. And then you combine it with that booster and it just blankets the entire place. It automatically boosts and turns down different radios depending on usage and stuff like that as well. So that's very nice. They also have different units that have Ethernet ports in those end repeater units. So if you want, say you have a, like an Xbox or a PC in an area and you want to have it on wired, you can use it as a wireless to Ethernet bridge as well where those beacons are at. It's nice, to, it's nice that it adjusts those signals because that means that it'll probably not have uh, signals that drown out other signals in the area if you're only using one of them. Yeah, that's the, I think that's kind of the idea. Um, so that's all, that's all the basics of how the Wi-Fi works, and it all is pretty sensible. I did a uh, – what I ended up grabbing was I got one of these APC units. It's about uh, – it's not the biggest milliamp ever. It's like 11,000 milliamps. I think you, you linked it in one of the shows. Yeah, I talked about it unplugged. It's got a removal battery. And it has uh, three USB ports that supply power and two regular AC plugs. Well, this Eero, I didn't know this when I, I, I didn't realize this, but the, the, uh, the base station is USB-C powered. Nice. So it's got a USB-C port and on the other end, USB-A. So I plug that into one of the USB ports on this APC. Well, my MiFi is USB powered. So I plug that into the other USB port. So the two devices I thought would go in the AC port or the AC plugs are open. And now you have AC ports. So I that's so that's the continuous uninter- uninterrupted power I'm getting is that little portable APC unit that I talked about Linux unplugged. Then on the other end I have a Netgear bridge that Noah told me all about. And this thing is a device that he's used for his customers and he's used it in production in their network for a while. And mm-hmm. so it's 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 pretty solid and reliable. And I thought, okay, well, if he's used this, if he's used this thing with the clients, I, I probably have a good chance that it's going to be reliable for me and my RV. And it's just a little Netgear Universal N300 Wi-Fi to Ethernet adapter. It's the WNCE 2001. And it just takes a like an 802.11n network or whatever you have and converts it to gigabit ethernet or i think it's maybe it's i don't know whatever and i just plugged that with a tiny little like a uh, two foot cord ethernet cord yeah i plugged the the netgear universal n300 wi-fi adapter into the arrow so he doesn't know i'm connected to a wi-fi it's totally ignorant to what my connectivity is it just sees an ip coming from this netgear Mm-hmm. The Netgear handles all of the communication to the MiFi. The Eero just gets an Ethernet cord, and uh, it's working super solid. And then from there, I go out to the boosters, and um, the Wi-Fi network has been rock solid. Not a single problem. I have full signal everywhere in the RV now. Videos start immediately, but what surprised me, and I don't really understand what the big difference is from my cradle point and the Eero, all web pages load faster. Everything on the internet seems faster. YouTube videos play faster. I, it's weird when you change out a router and everything seems faster. Mm-hmm. So the, it's, it's a pretty good equipment. The only downside I would say is uh, it's $250 for the main base station and a beacon. It's not that bad. It's, you know, it's, yeah, you know and that's multi, that's multi antenna and uh, beam forming and all that kind of crap. So it's not that bad. But what's really great is if you're a parent, it has built-in parental controls and grouping. So I've set up, I, I, don't, I don't use it because you'd have to pay for like the filtering, so I don't, I don't really use it for filtering, but I, it does have a really, really freaking handy profile version. And with these profiles, I've done a, like, a little, a, like a little reverse hack. I've set up two profiles to sort of work with the sometimes very limited internet that we have. I have all of the equipment, the laptop, all the smart stuff, any tablets, any phones, any watches that have Wi-Fi, all that stuff's in one profile. And then the TVs are in a second profile. And I open up the Eero app, and I got two buttons. And with one button, I can pause all the other gear, all their other, all the all the stuff, all uh, like uh, 19 other devices on my Wi-Fi network in the RV can be paused. The TVs get exclusive access to the internet, which clears up some buffering problems. Oh, and, so it makes everybody focus. Yeah, and then I can unpause it, or I can do the reverse. And when I'm doing shows from the RV, when I'm doing when I'm doing live streams, I'm going to just... Pause all of them. Yeah, I'll pause everything except for the live equipment. The live equipment will get exclusive access to the internet. 
You can also set up timers. So like if you always have dinner at like 6 p.m. Mm-hmm. or if you always want family time at Sunday at 4 or whatever, you can have it just automatically pause all the kids' devices. It gives you an overview screen of all the devices connected, the amount of bandwidth they're currently using. If you look at mine right now, AT&T is throttling me so bad that my down, it gives you a, it gives you a real-time speed test there at the bottom of the app. And right now my speed in the RV is 0.4 megabits down, 1.1 megabit up. So I can see I can also see when AT&T's throttling me, which is actually kind of cool. I um, wonder I wonder how they're doing that speed test. Oh, they they have they have I asked one of the developers actually. They have a server that they ping and do like a speed test from and when their server's down, they they'll use like some sort of speed test.net API. Well, isn't there is, is might that not cause some issues? Though? Oh yeah, it it uses you yeah it uses it only you can configure how often it checks. Yeah, so that's definitely something because yeah while it's checking it'll use my entire connection. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it you gives you an overview of all the devices that are connected and how much real time bandwidth they're taking, what their real time signal is, so you can see the health of all the devices and what their signal strength is. Nice. And this is the killer feature for me. In the app to manage all of it, you can tap a thing and switch entire networks. And I can manage Angela's network from anywhere I'm at. So I, it makes it really, really straightforward to manage multiple Eero networks. So I can have one at the RV. I can have one at Angela's house. If she needs something done, I can just hit a button. I flip over. It's, it feels like switching between Slack groups. Like you just pop right between different. And I assume the, the management interface can be accessed via both the phone and like probably a web browser. I've never, I don't know. I don't, I don't really know. It's, um, it's so simple. And so reliable that there's very little you actually need to do once it's going. Because yeah. it, I checked, my laptop has like an 850 megabit wireless connection to the AP. Like it's yeah. choosing. I was it, mostly asking for, for people that might not necessarily. I don't know if they do. It might phones. be an Android iPhone only kind of thing. Mm. Okay. Which is, you know, the way of the world. It's, it's sort of creepy <laughs> in a way. But uh, man, super well performing. I've, I've, I've just never been so happy with Wi-Fi. And it really, all of our home... All of our like home smart devices now are just super rapid response because it's all over the LAN. The LAN is crazy fast, as fast as the devices can connect. And, uh, it, oh, man, going from crashing three days to not a single problem is such a relief, yeah. such a huge relief. So I give a big thumbs up to Eero, E-E-R-O. Uh, and also, it looks like going by the PC per review, if you want another solution, the Amplify, A-M-P-L-I-F-I was also another contender. The Google one, dude, the Google Wi-Fi stuff in their in their tests, the performances were kind of pretty good, but it I think they said it crashed on them four times. Huh. It's a good right. What about the um the uh Unify stuff? Did they do that? You know, I, I if I was doing just something for me, no, they didn't. But if oh. I but just going to just uh, just just to address that stuff, if I was going something just for me, I might and just wanted one AP, yeah. I think I would do that. I think I would have done that. The reason I didn't is I wanted something that I could manage for both Angela and I, and I wanted something that had boosters so I could get through some well, metal walls. I think there is a unified solution that does have like the whole mesh thing. Oh, oh, I thought it needed an Ethernet backhaul. I don't think oh, so. Oh, see, that was the thing is I couldn't do... That was the other thing I liked is in Angela's house, Aero can use the Ethernet backhaul if you want, mm-hmm. but in the RV, I don't have one. And I, I was under the impression, based on the reading I did... No, I, th- I think they might have two separate products, uh-huh. one that uses Ethernet back. I'd still be... I'd love... Mesh only. I would love to know if anybody out there has experience with it. Because it, to me, it's still totally worth trying. Uh, I won't be doing it in... I mean, I am so happy with this Aero solution. Legitimately, I will tell you, one of the best $250 spent on technology in a long time. To have my networking just super rock-solid bulletproof, it's just... Uh, it's one of those things that you don't... You don't really appreciate it when you have it, but mm-hmm. when you don't have a reliable network, it fucks so much shit up that it, it, and if you're a technologist, it is so frustrating to have, like, you're sitting back there, you're trying to watch, like, a video right before you go to bed with your significant other, and the wireless crashes, and, and so the, the, the Kodi add-on takes a dump, and it's so, Im- it's embarrassing, it's frustrating, it's the, it's the exact opposite of what you're trying to get out of the moment, all of these things, or you're trying to do a show and Skype can't keep a connection available for its life, like just getting rid of all that stuff is so worth the $250. Um, I, I really recommend it. And if you have you know, another Wi-Fi setup that does like this mesh stuff, please send us your feedback. Maybe do a hashtag Ask Air and let us know. I'd, I'd really, or leave in the comments. I'd really like to hear about it. Do not send us the same kind of feedback that the YouTube comments did, though. Oh, what do they say about it? 
No, no, back at the beginning of what we started oh, talking oh, oh, about. Oh, yeah, this. yeah, the vlog type ones, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, you know, that's just what happens, I think, when you get to the larger audience like that. But what's funny is, it, you know, what all those people are attacking me for is actually the journey that started me down here to end up where I'm at, where I needed to replace this, I wanted to automate this. For me, if I can have a temperature sensor in my water bay that automatically turns on a light bulb when it gets to 35 degrees and turns it off when it gets to 38 degrees... Why not just like I, if I can do that in a few minutes, I can get that set up and then I never have to worry about it again. I'll, that'll never happen to me again. You it took seems totally worth it. You took something that was a problem and turned it into a learning experience that made your life better. Computers are great and you can spin one up in seconds over DigitalOcean. Just use our promo code Here's the Thing after you have created an account, DigitalOcean.com. You can deploy a droplet in seconds. You'll get root access, and you'll be online and logged in. I bet you can get it all done in less than 55 seconds. They have SSDs for all them rigs and a DigitalOcean dashboard for days and a simple API that is intuitive, easy to use, and tons of open source apps are built around it already. JBot for life. In fact, our own JBot uses uh, that DigitalOcean API quite a bit. Something they've added quite a while ago now but it's still new to me because I've been a DigitalOcean customer for over four years now, is highly available block storage. Up to 16 terabytes you can attach to your droplet. Additional storage. Yeah, if you want to, like, store a human genome or something. Or, you know, I've done an MB server. That was a really cool project I did where I took a Fedora box, I put installed Cockpit, and then I deployed MB inside a container and then used the block storage to grow and and it was just it was a fun project and also one of the things that's really great is the private networking if it's all inside the data center doesn't go against any of your transfer doesn't make so you can use like a back end server for storage and a front end MB box and they have team accounts if you want to work with multiple people monitoring and alerting so you get metrics for performance of course you get alerts if something's down you know you look like a boss and they have tons of pre-built open source applications you can deploy in seconds or just do a base rig, including Alan Jude's beloved FreeBSD. It's mm-hmm. all over at DigitalOcean, even that BSD for how, some reason. How, how many providers can you can you get ZFS on? I know. And you know what's really cool about when they do it is they go right upstream. They, they talk to the Fedora project. They talk to FreeBSD. They, they talk to CoreOS. Like it's, they get official communication channels and software channels set up with these people. It's the way you would want to do it. And then on top of it all, just amazing documentation. I've said enough. You need to just go try it. Just sign up, create an account, and then apply our promo code. Here's the thing. It's all one word. It'll give you a $10 credit over at DigitalOcean.com. Are you familiar with this, the international thing? Uh, that's the, the Dota 2 tournament. Yeah, yeah. Thing. And there's like a $24 million prize. Yeah, it's, uh, if not the biggest, one of the biggest tournaments. Dota 2 is huge, huge. Yeah. All right, well. And anything that's a MOBA is pretty much huge. We'll have links in the show notes, but there was this big production. So they brought out like this, like totally full-time professional Dota 2 player. Uh, Danielle, I think is his name, uh, Ishton. I'm sorry, I, I shouldn't even bother. Uh, and he goes by uh, Dendi online. And he got his ass kicked so bad. <laughs> and they built up like for, for like this huge thing. They, they have this huge stage. They have this massive crowd. It's like a huge sporting event. And they bring out the first guy. And it's, they walk him out and he's wearing a white coat with a hood over like a boxer. He comes out, his hands are taped up. <laughs> like he's all pumped up and ready to go. Like this is the best Dota 2 player in the world. This guy is rich because he plays Dota 2 so good. I mean, it's a big hype fest. And they're like, and then his one-on-one c- competitor, his number one challenger. And they go and the camera s- s- just swings across the stage. To a computer. And they pull off a cloth off a computer. And the crowd goes, <gasps> And then one of the stagehands comes out and he holds a USB thumb drive high up in the air. And the camera does a close-up. And the crowd goes, ooh. And then he very thematically plugs the USB j- pl- uh, thumb drive into the PC tower and cue the open AI video. Where they do an introduction of this bot that uses open AI and it's going to kick this guy's ass. OpenAI is Elon Musk's project that he started back in 25 or 2015, I should say, with uh, so a couple other people. And they all threw in a billion dollars into OpenAI to essentially create what they say a friendly AI that develops to benefit humanity instead of destroy us. Is this is this 
the same Elon Musk that like a week ago said that AI is going to destroy yep. us. So this is like his hedge. This is what that's legitimately what he's doing here. This is one well, this, him and this some is friends. a nice AI to fight Sky, Skynet. Is that what it is? I legitimately what they're trying to build. <laughs> yeah, and you can find out more at OpenAI.com, and it's like AI for everybody. So they um, they have a couple of different uh, projects in the works, and I don't know where the funding exactly came from. I don't know if Elon personally wrote the check or what, but this team at OpenAI took a bot. And they trained a bot in a way that has never been done before. They, they didn't give it any instructions. They, they didn't teach it any strategy. They created a copy of it. And then they set the two off to play on Dota 2. And they built in this metric system so they could analyze how the bots played. That makes sense. And then they could give the bots general feedback. like So the bots would play four human lifetimes worth of games. And then they would average out some of the decisions the bots made, and they would give them what they called coaching advice. And then the game would play another few human lifetimes worth of Dota 2, and they would coach it. And it would, it would always have an evenly matched competitor because it was constantly running against a duplicate of itself. Okay, so it's running against a duplicate? They're not, like, learning independently of each other? I believe not. I believe as one AI learns something, they, they both get the information. Yeah, and then they have to refine and fight. See, to me, it would make more sense to have them independent of each other because then they sure. could be developing strategies to counter each other that I, person might not think of. I wonder. I don't know I don't know the intricate details of how they programmed it, but this this whole advantage it has where it you know in a day it can play lifetimes worth of Dota 2. And so over over this process it has become this unstoppable Dota 2 player and it crushed this professional player, but not just him. They brought in like five guys below him that are also super professional Dota 2 players, and it crushed all of them. Yeah, okay. So that makes much more sense because I was going to say Dota 2 is actually a team game with five players. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this was a big event being one-on-one. It was like a big special thing, yeah. Uh, So wait, did, did... did they did, did it play all of them one on one? They did both. They did group comp- competition and they did one on one against certain hmm. like really well known export players. It kind of made me want to play Dota to tell you the truth. <laughs> it actually did, but uh, so they held a one versus one like big expedition, and uh, the guy ended up quitting the game afterwards because wow. he got trounced two two times in a row. In fact, he even said stop. He yelled at the thing, "Stop bullying me!" before he quit. <laughs> uh, and um, oh, oh, you mean he quit the actual game, not like quit the game forever. Well, no, no, he he quit the game forever. He says, uh, "Oh, yeah, I, I don't believe that." I know it seemed a little, it seemed a little convoluted. Although there was a language barrier, so I don't know. It could have been that's, but it sounded like almost like scripted to me, like they had planned for it to go this way. The thing was, is that at the time this guy sat down to play the game, the AI had beaten everyone else be, b- behind him. So yeah. I think he knew. I don't know. I I feel like it's kind of the same situation as um, the the chess playing computers right right yeah it was also that go game that uh they say the next stop the next step is to build a group of bots that can compete against a team together of top human players um alpha go that's what it was alpha go this is uh you know what's what what strikes me about this this is like this is like baby ai this is baby bot stuff. This is like super early. This is like, in a, if you were to put it in a human perspective, this is like a one-year-old mm-hmm. stuff. B- maybe not even, maybe maybe this is like, this is like maybe 10 months old. Mm-hmm. This is in, in AI terms. And, and they're, they're creaming us. They're creaming us. And it, when it, it taught itself. It taught itself. It played against itself and it taught itself. It figured out a game that involves the thing about Dota 2 that you have to appreciate if you're not a player is it it intrinsically involves deceit. You trick people into attacking the wrong target. You you anticipate people that are trying to deceive you and you have to preemptively counter attack them when you know what is likely a fake attack versus a real attack. Like there is genuine complex strategy and deceivement yeah. it, involved. It's, it's all a matter of balance and trade-offs and yeah, I might I might lose this thing, but if I lose this thing over here, they're going to be over here so I can grab this other objective. Yeah. I mean, it's not like it's, oh my gosh. And the fact that it's beating us so handily and the fact that what seems to be, to me, the unavoidable truth of it is this: these damn things can can spend 
a day and they have a, they have accumulated a lifetime's worth of experience. You know what would be hilarious? Is if Elon Musk, by trying to create a counter to Skynet, creates Skynet. Hilarious? Um. <laughs> well, I mean, if Skynet kills me, I'll have been laughing right up until it kills me. <laughs> okay, there you go. I'll put a few links to OpenAI in the show notes if you guys want to check it out. Um, it's not just Elon Musk. Uh, Stephen Hawking also is pretty yeah. worried about this, and uh, Stuart Russell and others that are pretty well known are worried about this. So mm-hmm. I'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. But yeah, they're really hyped about it. Uh, there's a video. It's about 20 minutes long, 25 minutes long, but you only really need the first 15 minutes because it just goes downhill from there. We'll have that linked in the show notes too. So what I'm hearing is. Uh, I've I've got a movie idea here where all the smartest guys in the world create an AI and then we have to go find the biggest dumb dumb to figure out how to counter it. Wow. Hey Beardsley, are you familiar with the Dolphin project? The uh, uh, the Wii slash GameCube emulator? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Super interesting project because they're solving some amazingly complicated technical problems, which you wouldn't, I guess, think of at first. You'd think of like CPU well, emulation. But not only that, but on top of that, they're actually improving on the actual original hardware. Yeah, yeah. So this is where it gets really interesting. They're working on stuff now where they could potentially generate shaders beforehand. They could predict where the game's going next. They could share shaders. Like, they're working on big stuff. Yeah, you can add shaders that don't actually belong to the game that you're trying to play to make it better, yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. So they've been working on a whole new pipeline to deliver this kind of stuff and totally take advantage of the graphics card, and they've been testing all this various stuff. And this is going to be a user error edition of Linux does what Mac can't. So Uber Shaders 2.0 will be landing in Dolphin, and uh, the GIFs, or GIFs, that they have embedded in their post really make it look good. Like, this is Metroid Prime right here, Mm -hmm. Metroid Prime 3. Oh my gosh, does it look incredible. But there's one problem, one, one problem. It's not Vulkan. It's not NVIDIA's shader issue with OpenGL's compared to Direct3D. That is a problem. Is it uh, Apple's ancient version of OpenGL? Yeah, it's the damn Mac. It's the damn Mac. Uh, this, is a, this is a problem that most Mac users may not really be aware of, but uh, they have a super outdated, inefficient OpenGL 4.1 driver on Mac OS that simply are not up to the tasks anymore of handling some of the stuff that the Dolphin Project is working on. They say they're not e- it's not even useful. Um, they're, uh, they're, pretty much, they're pretty much stuck because they're going to have to do like some sort of reduced functionality mode on the Mac. Uh, and uh, they kind of blame some of this on the fact that uh, Apple's getting all into metal. Because they say, look, on Linux and on Windows, we have options. On Windows, we can use Direct3D or OpenGL or, hell, Vulkan. And on Linux, we're going to use Vulkan. It's sort of obvious, unless it's an Intel card right now, we're going to use OpenGL. But for the Mac, it's sort of like, well, Apple's just started, stopped updating OpenGL for us, and we're just sort of stuck, and we're not going to spend the time to rewrite all this in metal. Yeah. They've got to, Apple has got to get on the Vulkan train if they want Apple users to be able to play these games and do VR. Like, they're all in on VR and all this stuff, but to... To not, maybe, maybe, I don't know, maybe the next version of macOS, maybe they'll ship Vulkan. I don't know if High Sierra has Vulkan or not. I feel like Apple has had so many successes in this way that they think they can't fail at, like, implementing a new standard. Because I feel like for the past decade, they've implemented new stuff and just through pure market force have made it work. Well, sure, on the iPhone I could see it, but on the Mac desktop, I feel like there's just too many other market factors at play and they don't have that luxury. No, I agree. I, I'm just saying, I feel like they, they have this blind spot where they think they can just push anything and it will eventually gain adoption. This is where Linux, to me, is the most refreshing. There isn't some strategy at play. There isn't some sort of long-term market goal. It's just make a great fucking workstation And there's not like some big corporate overlord that says, we've really got to push metal so that way we have a beachhead in VR in 2025. You know, or like whatever their reasoning is, it just doesn't exist on Linux. And sometimes that means we don't skate fast enough to where the puck's going. But other times it means my workstation doesn't get drug around by the nose. Even even if it's not like something 
nefarious like that, even if they just think metal is a technically superior implementation, which in some ways it does seem like it is. Yeah, I can see it on mobile, especially. But yeah, I mean, metal, it seems great. It seems fine. But they need to realize that if you just keep putting yourself on an island, all you're going to do is isolate yourself on an island. Unless that island is huge. But their desktops aren't. Anyways, it's a really fascinating post, and it is way, way, way above my pay grade. But um, if you thought building a Nintendo GameCube emulator was a simple thing, turns out some of the most interesting and complicated things happening in 3D graphics are happening with the Dolphin Project. Dolphin-EMU.org, and I'll have a link to the specific blog post. And if you're interested in this kind of stuff, there's also a... SNES emulator. It used to be called BSNES. I think it's called something else now. But the the guy there has a blog. He is doing cycle accurate emulation of the Super Nintendo. So he's got a lot of interesting stuff with emulators too. Well, who needs the SNES Classic? Exactly. And the NES Classic. Screw Nintendo. <laughs> you can't stop the signal. Patreon.com slash Jupiter Signal. Help make the network stronger and keep us independent. The Jupiter Broadcasting Network has been running Patreon campaigns for a while now, but only really recently did something click with me that I kind of feel like an idiot. And so if you haven't met a patron or you've been one before and you want to come back, we got something new that I probably should have thought of a long time ago, but Chris is a dumb man, and it takes him a while to think of this stuff. We have created no a podcast. No disagreement here. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, I think, I think. Uh, we have created a podcast for our patrons. Why did it take me this long to figure that out? Well, not only that, we gave our patrons a way to show off that they're patrons, too. Oh, that's right. We've integrated Patreon. I feel like we're doing a lot of Patreon stuff. We are. We are. In fact, a lot of the stuff that says you get is like only half of it because we also, I don't think we even mentioned the fact that we post the live version of our shows a lot. The entire live versions often get posted as long as YouTube doesn't smack it down. Or the backgrounds are used there. From time to, I haven't posted them for a while because nobody seemed to. Wow, Chris, there's people that have been asking. Have they? Yeah. Oh, I stopped posting because nobody was commenting or liking the post, so I'm like, well, nobody seems to be... Well, at least there's people on YouTube asking. Really? Maybe I should tell them to become a patron. Maybe we should start posting it in Discord. We could do that. Yeah. Because, I mean, you know, they're, they're, they're all public images. Yeah. I just didn't think the patrons were... Care- I don't know. Let me know. In fact, let us know. One of the ways, one of the mechanisms, this is what I, this is what I was getting to, the lead here, is we're doing the Jupiter Signal podcast where it's like right now, I, I'm thinking like once a month because you got plenty of podcasts mm-hmm. and it's really a, a lot about Jupiter Broadcasting. But And then I joined Chris in the first episode and he doesn't want to do it without me anymore. That's true. So we might, we might record another one very soon though. So if you want to get that, there's one already published. There's another one coming. There's a dedicated RSS feed for each individual patron. Patreon.com slash Jupiter Signal. Plus you get the live shows and maybe, maybe you know, Go get some flair in our Discord and grab the images. We're, maybe we'll start posting them there. I don't know. Let us know what you think about that, too, in the in, on the Jupiter Signal thread. Patreon.com slash Jupiter Signal. It's time for a little Ask Air. People tweeted us hashtag Ask Air and then sent in their question. The first one off the list, hashtag Ask Air. What are your secret not safe for work man grooming tips? Um, wow. <laughs> I did not expect that. What do you, uh, what do you want to, do you want to answer this first or do you want me to? Listen, I just let it all go natural. Wow. Oh, wow. Wow. Okay. So should we just move on? Uh, here's my news. <laughs> no, I want to hear yours, Chris. Uh, if I'm going to be embarrassed as fuck, you are too. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, use, use talcum powder. That's my, that's my <laughs> not safe for work. Use talcum powder. It's delightful. Uh, get the Perrier version off of Amazon. You'll love it. I think that's what it is. Either that or that's sparkling water. All right. Uh, a hashtag Ask Air comes into the show. Um, and, and it was, I, I love this one because it's, it's sort of philosophical. Are you ready? Mm-hmm. Uh, hashtag Ask Air. If money was no longer a thing, what would you do for motivation? For motivation? I mean, do I need motivation? I mean, I just. If I guess it wasn't motivation. It was what would you pursue? Sorry, I was I was doing it from memory. It was hashtag ask air. Money isn't a need anymore, and time is no longer a worry. What would you pursue? Boy, that was a way better. I, that was a way reading it exactly <laughs> was way better than the one I remembered. Money isn't a need. Time is not a worry. That that middle part right there is is the biggest for me. Time is not a worry. Just even even just briefly conceptualizing that reality. It makes me feel elated. Like it is the, that is the number one problem in my world. Honestly, my answer feels like the stuff that I've been talking about for weeks. I'd get a house. 
and I'd do Twitch, and I'd be happy. I would travel. I would travel, and I would I would make more shows and more vlogs. Yeah, I would probably also travel as well. But I would, uh, I would also spoil my kids. <laughs> probably not for the better. But I, I feel I like do. I feel like my road to happiness is a very simple road. I just need to figure out how to get there. Yeah, my my road to happiness really is if I had more money and more time. Everything else I am capable of achieving, like on my, like if I had more time and more money, I could do a lot more. Like to me, for me to be happy, I want to do something that makes other people happy. I like making other yeah. people feel good. Yeah, I, I agree. I like, like, I love making people feel good. I love having, giving them something to like a routine to like tune into on their commute or when they're going to work and, you know, having someone they can hang out with while they're driving. I also like uh, helping inform the conversation. Like to me, I, when I started Linux Action News, I had no idea that the most rewarding aspect of it was going to be deep diving into research and actually like contacting people behind the stories and getting clarifications about stuff. Mm-hmm. When I did last, I did the news for 10 years and I didn't really, it, it, time allowed for some of that. Yeah, you had to mostly be surface level just because of the amount of stuff you were There covering. was so much more show. I had picks, I had a main topic, we had feedback to get to, but now with Linux Action News, it's just the news. And so that's where all of the time and attention goes. And the thing is, is Joe has a great set of contacts. I have a great set of contacts. There's a lot of people we can just ask directly what the real story is. And mm-hmm. um, I did not expect that to be as fulfilling as it was. And that's something I really enjoy. I'd like to do more of that, really. So that's one of the things I'd do if I had more time. All right. Uh, Sam asks, has to, I should try to say their names. So I'll try to say everybody's names. Well, who's ha- the last guy? <clears throat> oh, okay. Let me scroll down. <laughs> uh, Ricky. Oh, okay. So hashtag Sam uh, says, uh, ask air. I'm trying to cut down on my internet usage. I feel a little spoiled. Have any of you guys ever felt the same? I feel like for you, you kind of addressed that earlier where you said you just ignore the internet for the first few hours of the day now. Right. And this is like a, this is like a recent thing for me. Yeah. Honestly, I don't really feel spoiled, but I also don't feel like I could live without the internet. I feel like I am a very internet focused beard i'll tell you yeah you are and 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 i don't and i say that in a, in a good way but i'll tell you where the red line is for me which i would never cross and you do and that is you leave notifications on during the night yeah uh like irc even yeah i never do that i dnd turns on like at 8 p.m and it don't turn off until i'm ready to go back to work i am one of those people that is 24 7 internet connected <sighs> it feels like that leads to burnout no, for me, I just set very firm lines, and anybody that crosses that line gets very pissed off. Well, beard. yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, you, you won't be afraid to tell somebody that they're being dumb. So, but, so it, but you still get woken up. You still get that buzz. You know, you still get that... Rah, rah. Not really too often, though, because I, I've set that line so firmly, people just don't fuck with me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Un- until recently, and more people have been getting yelled at. That may change, though. I mean, like, so now you're on air, and so now it's like there's always new people learning about you. They don't know the rules. I mean, I don't plus, have... you don't want to scare people away too much, because, like, if people are, like, too worried to talk to you, then you don't hear from people. I don't have notifications on universally. Honestly, uh, okay. if I'm being perfectly honest... The only place that I really disable notifications is for Jupiter Broadcasting because I feel like those notifications, 98% of the time, I can get to them when I'm ready to get to yeah. them. Yeah. Well, that's good. I thought, because, yeah, I mean, I know I've been able to send you a message in the middle of the night and woken your ass up. That, well, I leave them on for you because usually I feel like if you're going to say something to me, it's probably important. Yeah. And you actually are like one of the few people that I know that like has like, multiple back doors to get to me even yeah. if when i have everything turned yeah. off so <laughs> you, <laughs> you get that yeah um okay so let's see let's read through the list here um we did get uh, we did get a few uh, uh that i thought would be interesting now here was one that came into the show that we, we could talk about uh, jacob writes uh, hashtag ask air i had a dream last night where at chris las announces that the beard has left jupiter broadcasting what's the interpretation guys what's the interpretation well, I feel like a he's a user error listener, so he's he's heard about me making a transition. 
but maybe he misinterpreted that or his subconscious did. It's like um it's like when your subconscious is processing a big change in your life, like a divorce or uh <clears throat> you've moved. And so what he's what he's processing is the idea of the of the of that silent unknown figure who has cut, encoded and published episodes silently behind the scenes for years is going away. Yeah. I think that's what he's thinking. Maybe he's afraid that, that the, the person that takes his place isn't going to be as good and, and his shows are going to suffer. Well, that's usually the case with a new person for a little while. So I don't know, Chris. I feel like out of the gate, I was better than you. Wow. <laughs> wow. I mean, if I wasn't, would you have kept me on? <laughs> <laughs> all right. So now the ones that I have been avoiding, because they're all kind of the same topic, hashtag ask air. Was re- this was a response to a question that we asked last week. And it was essentially there's two opinions in the show. Uh, the uh, My opinion was that uh, we should try to include a minimum viable amount of Linux in every episode. Uh, that's something you want to hear about, the, the operating system you love, minimal, vi- minimum viable Linux. Right. <laughs> and the Beard's position was, nay, if we don't have anything actually relevant to us as hosts... Because this is really kind of like a human, we're the users, and so are you, we shouldn't force it. It should just be when there's actually something to talk about. Now, it's not that I disagree with that, it's just that I want to make sure we're meeting expectations. So we punted to the audience and we said, what do you think? And uh, do you side with Chris? Do you side with the hair? Do you side with the beard? I believe is what we asked. Yeah, it turns out I think uh, nobody likes hair. (sighs) Yeah, everybody went with the beard, actually. Uh, so going through here, uh, hashtag ask air response was, I side with the beard, no Linux tax, says Paulo. Uh, no Linux tax. I thought that was an interesting way to say it. Uh, salts for the boys, hashtag ask air. I'm with the beard. If something Linux-centric pops up of significance to the network, then you should talk about it. Otherwise, don't talk about it. Um, and it was sort of went on from there. We're still collecting feedback, so you can still send yours. Hashtag Ask Air. We prefer questions in that format, too. So if you want to get your question right on the show, that'd be a good way to send it in. Hashtag Ask Air. Beard and Chris, do you guys think it's really weird when you show up at the ER and they have no idea of any of your past history? Like, you're totally new to them. Yeah, uh, I feel like it's... Uh... A very messed up situation in the the medical industry where like if you go to a new place they don't really have easy access to your medical records which is something that's probably really important to you know keeping you alive you know rika i blame the stethoscope before the stethoscope the doctor went to your home he interviewed you he got a complete picture of your woes your living conditions your symptoms and he would diagnose you that way. And then after the damn stethoscope came along, they started hearing the way your heart sounds and the way you breathe. And the doctor started telling you what's wrong. And now you telling the doctor what's wrong. The whole relationship flipped around. Now, if that sounds like bullcrap, it's actually true. I'll link to a 99% Invisible episode that just aired, episode 270, The Stethoscope. It's a fascinating story about how medicine changed in the 1800s because of the damn stethoscope. And my point is, I really hate how mechanical the medical process is. I hate that they go through these same procedures that they always go through, so that way it feels like it's some sort of official process. They make notes in their stupid little chart about me, and then they tell me what's wrong. I, 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 I am, I, I just, the entire system feels completely detached from any actual customer care, and it feels all about liability deferred. And it feels like they're deferring liability, they're, they're, they're trying not to get their asses sued, and they want to bill the insurance companies as much as possible, and I'm just the, I am just the cog in which they facilitate all of that. I don't blame the stethoscope, I blame the insurance industry. I'm being facetious about it. Yeah, 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 I know. I, I'm I know. joking about the stethoscope. It really, it's just, it's the perfect symbol of the moment when me- yeah, medicine yeah. came from the patient tells the doctor what's wrong to the doctor tells the patients what's wrong. And it's not that the doctors aren't the experts. Obviously, that's why you go to the doctor. I'm not saying you shouldn't take the doctor. Yeah, that's, that's... I'm, I'm fine with the, the process. Yeah. I'm... Well, I'm not. Well, no, I'm fine with the process. I'm not fine with the fact that because of that process, there's no longer a conversation. Mm-hmm. So when it comes to sharing the data... Um... In a perfect world, if there was a really well-encrypted way to do that that required patient authorization, yeah, I'd be for that. In the reality in which we all find ourselves, 
Uh, well, here's an idea. I'm not so a fan. I'm not a big How fan. How about these hospitals provide a patient the copy of the data so they can take it where they want? Yeah, but then what? Are you going to trust average consumers with super confidential? I mean, I guess. I mean, it's their information. I guess. I guess. Yeah, I guess. Honestly, it feels like we should all have these super great portable computers in our pockets that have like these encrypted areas that only we can access and things like your medical information and your financial information would just be synced wirelessly like over like some sort of like short ra- short near field contact system i'm not i don't know what it would be but some sort of near field contact system where you would just put your device down you'd authenticate with your thumbprint there would be some sort of secure enclave and you would be able to store information in there that the os couldn't access and you could use that to move it around if there was something you could use that then you could store your financial information your health information and it would be in your own power but until everybody has access to something like that i just don't really see this as a viable system and i don't want the companies doing it I, i feel like um there's these buildings that keep us uh, alive yeah, uh, and they are silos and nothing should be shared between those silos because there might be cross contamination. Yeah. You, you yeah. know, you can't control this stuff. So sure. you should just stay as your silo and you'll be fine. So I have been in the position though, where uh, I've had to go to my family doctor and get all of my medical history. And then I've had to take it to another doctor's and, office because I needed it done in a certain amount of and time. And how much of a process was it to get that medical history? Well, it's enough. You know, I call ahead of time and I ask, what time should I stop by? And then they got to make sure you get there on Monday because the records gal only works Monday through Wednesday and she's out Thursday and Friday. So make sure you get there on a Monday. And if you're going to do it on a Monday, you probably want to get there before 10. So I get there on a Monday before 10. And, uh, you know, Susan finally gives me a copy of all my records. They look like a, they were copied off of a fax machine for some reason. I don't understand why, but whatever. I put them in a vanilla envelope that then I seal. I take it over to the other doctor's office when the other rec- records gal is there. I hand it to her and then she adds it to a file. And now all of a sudden they have my records. And of course, if I go to the other doctor's office and do anything, they don't have a copy of that. So it's a really broken system. No, no. But I just couldn't imagine some private entity stepping in and doing it right. Here's an idea. What if you just you went to your doctor for your regular checkout? You said, hey, uh, can I get an update of my medical records? And you just hand them a USB key. And then they go and they get your medical records and they come back and they hand you back your USB key and you have your medical records in your possession for with minimal effort. Yeah, and it's like on a Lux encrypted partition and it just auto mounts on the doctor's Ubuntu desktop. That'd be amazing. Except for the fact that I would lose a thumb drive and the doctors wouldn't have the appropriate software to actually properly encrypt it and it would eventually become up become a malware delivery platform. Maybe. I, that's, that's just thing. It's like it's got to be something, anything that you would lose, anything that you have to hold on to, like the very fact that you can call well, up. I, I, I was just thinking of a thumb drive as a transport mechanism. It could be anything. Yeah. Yeah. I, but where would you store it? Well, I mean, you did talk about phones. Yeah. That's that's just it. That's, yeah. That's a tough, it's a tough, it's a tough problem. And uh, it's, it's challenging for those of us that are moving around between doctors because of changes in health insurance, which has happened to me, but also it's challenging for those of us that travel because I can end up in a different state and all of a sudden have a medical emergency and not having that information digitally available is a massive hindrance. Yeah, I feel like the medical field is simultaneously one of the most advanced fields that we have, but at the same time, it is so far behind the times. It kind of reflects education a lot in that way. And then our last question, hashtag ask air. Which fictional character do you guys hate? Uh, one comes to mind for me. I definitely have one that comes to mind. Mm-hmm. Uh, goddamn Kai Wynn from Deep Space Nine. Yeah, and you're completely wrong. What? <laughs> she, she's, she's not a bad character. She not only, so she was the ambitious Bajoran religious leader in mm-hmm. Deep Space Nine, and then she becomes pivotal to like the downfall of... Uh, of uh, Galticott. Yeah. Spoiler and alert. Could you have told that story without her as that character? So here's, I'm, I'm of two minds. You're right. She was a good character. And now I, later on watching Deep Space Nine, I appreciate that. During mm-hmm. the time though, I was, it was, it was the nineties. I was younger and uh, she just made my blood boil every time she was on screen. But now looking back at it, I do understand the role she played, but she played it so, she played it so well that I hated her. I really just, I just couldn't stand that character. But that just makes it even better. That makes, that's a better reason to like her as a character. Yeah, I know, I know. Okay, so while, if you want to stick with the Deep Space Nine theme, what was the name of the, uh, 
of the uh, Vegas uh, Sinatra knockoff that they had in season seven that stole all of the good scenes from Quark? Oh, I don't remember. Vic? Vic Fontaine? Was it yeah, Vic Fontaine? Some, yeah, something Fontaine. Man, I hate that guy. I hate what... So first of all, get your damn karaoke out of my Star Trek. Second of all, way <laughs> to kill the last season. And third of all, give every single one of those scenes to Quark, and it's instantly better. I agree. They He ruined the, the, that last season. I feel like... Okay, now this is going to be controversial. Oh, opinion. here we go. I'm fired up. I feel like every holodeck episode of Star Trek was almost garbage. Of course, Vic Fontaine existed on the damn holodeck. Yep. Yeah, almost Across all of them. all series. Yeah, I agree. I would say there's a couple of standouts, but for the most part, they're all just horrible. And he was he was really the personification of that. Like, I felt... Damn, Vic Back Fontaine. when I was watching Star Trek on TV, if I saw that it was going to be a holodeck episode, I just turned it off and did other things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't need Vic. It, it's a filler episode. So there you go. Ask us your question, hashtag ask air, and we will attempt to answer it in the next episode. Also still taking your thoughts on the Linux tax. Are you minimum viable Linux? Hashtag with the hair, hashtag ask air. Or are you with the beard? Hashtag ask air, hashtag with the beard. Let us know. Chris, hmm? maybe we should... Uh... <laughs> what? Wait, where, where am I? Where? What's going on? Maybe we should up the stakes of this ask air. Okay, go. Whoever... Less people side with has to uh, shave. What? Whichever, uh, whichever uh, thing we're representing. What? I can't shave my hair, dude. I'm growing it out. Well, I can't shave my beard. So that's why this would be amazing. I can't do that. I'm growing my hair out right now. But have you ever tried bald? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going. I'm going. I know. I know. It's 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 against your hipster aesthetic. No, here's what I'm going to. Gr- I'm going for gold with the hair growth while I can, because I figure like in a year or so or something, I'm going to grow it out, or it's going to start going gray, or I'm going to thin out. So I feel like this is my last opportunity to go for gold. I can't cut it now. All right, audience. I tried. Chris is a chicken. Give me something else. Give me something else. I mean, Wes is already throwing Gen Two and Slackware challenges at me, which is just. I mean, I'm I'm dancing. I'm on my toes. I'm fine. It's just fine. I got this. I'm on my toes. I'm dancing. No I might be crashing, that. but I'm dancing. Yeah, but he threw the Gen 2 one at me right as we're going out on Linux Unplugged last week. He's <laughs> like, boom, Gen 2 dick on the table. And I'm like, well, this is the wrap up. I got to like accept your dick invitation or else because it's like the music is like wrapping us up now. You heard it here first. Chris is accepting Wes's dick. So I just, I now, so here's the, I can't cut my hair. Here's the other problem is that, that I can already tell. I mean, I'm not a dumb man, although I am sometimes a dumb man. But I can tell you by reading this Twitter feed, it is already trending in your direction. Like if I was a weatherman, I got like a 70% chance right now of calling the weather. And the weather is side with beard. So you're afraid to be bald. Is that what you're saying? Well, I... I'm in the middle of growing my hair out. Is what I'm saying. Damn it, Rika. Damn it. You know you that's true. You have the rest of your life to you grow your hair out. You know I am wearing this beanie because my hair is awkwardly long right now. You have the rest of your life to grow your hair out, Chris. Yeah. Okay, so uh, first of all, I don't believe that you'd shave your beard. Uh, now give me something else to shave. 